So uh, I started my research actually um, as a result of uh, Dana Colpin, who you just heard from. Uh, we, I saw his paper um, as I was in my postdoc and um, learned about the potential for pharmaceuticals being out in the environment. It wasn't even anything that I had thought about before. Um, I was doing natural product chemistry uh, before that. And um, so when I started my position at the School of Freshwater Sciences, I made that one of my focus areas. Um, I just wanted to give a plug for our school. It's a relatively new school. We're about eight years old now. And we have everything from aquaculture programs to environmental uh, toxicology to um, bacteria metagenomics um, to technology development and other things. And it's a really great interdisciplinary program if you're interested in doing some graduate work in freshwater science. Um, so when I began my research, I started looking out my back door. So the Great Lakes um, are right next to us. We have Lake Michigan basically attached to our building. And um, the question I started to ask was if we see all these uh, emerging contaminants in streams, as uh, the USGS found. What about in our Great Lakes ecosystem? And the thought before was that uh, in the Great Lakes, you know, such a huge water body that any kind of pollution going in there from a wastewater treatment plant, if you're finding um, nanogram per liter concentrations in streams, you probably wouldn't find anything going out into the Great Lakes. But I had to ask the question, well, well are we finding anything out there? And that was where I started. And as Dana mentioned, there are a bunch of different kind of compounds that fall under this emerging contaminant umbrella. Um, and they basically are, uh, they're also called trace organics if you're talking to a wastewater treatment plant operator. These are minor components that are part of their removal strategy, but it's real, they're not really targeted. And wastewater treatment plants aren't uh, designed to remove these things. They do remove them to some extent, and some uh, compounds better than others, but um, there are quite a few of them that go through, as we know, um, in small quantities. Uh, I also focus more on the pharmaceuticals and personal care products, but I also have a whole body of work on nanomaterials and what kind of impacts they might have. And um, so although I deal more with, as a biologist, what kind of impacts these chemicals might have, the question was, if you really are trying to figure out realistically what kind of impacts they might have, you need to know what kind of concentrations the organisms are exposed to. So we started out by doing this. Um, presence study in the environment. And so to, to determine they are harmful, you have to know uh, who might be exposed, um, and, and most importantly, at what concentration. Um, so again, doing that environmental study. And then is there any kind of impact at that dose? Um, and one of the reasons I was interested in pharmaceuticals is because they're designed to be active at a very low concentration. Um, they have very specific targets in, in, uh, in our own bodies that uh, are triggered, and so the idea in our lab was to go after those targets and say, you know, we have the most prescribed medications, we have things that are found out in the environment, what kinds of impacts, are they the same kind of impacts you would see in humans? And uh, the Great Lakes, as elsewhere, there are several different routes of exposure, as, as Dana mentioned. Um, one of the main things that we were looking at were the compounds coming out from our wastewater treatment plants around the Milwaukee area, again, right out our back door. Um, and so we also have issues of uh, leaky infrastructure in Milwaukee, uh, which has been documented by um, our really successful bacterial folks. Um, showing how much leakage is happening out of our wastewater treatment, uh, not just the wastewater treatment plant, but also the pipes going around the city. And so we built off that research when, when studying the Great Lakes. And uh, we picked a couple of our wastewater treatment plants that are right, um, that deal with the majority of sewage from the Milwaukee area. This is the South Shore Wastewater Treatment Plant, No Creek, and as well as the one downtown Milwaukee, uh, Jones Island. Uh, and so, First thing we did was looked at uh, what kinds of things were going through the wastewater treatment plant. So we had a parent study uh, funded by Veolia and also the wastewater treatment plant itself, uh, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. And we looked at um, the stuff going through the wastewater treatment plant, and then the next day we would go and look out in the lake. So we had the idea of over a 24-hour period what was flowing through the wastewater treatment plant, and then what we might find if we went from the wastewater treatment plant outfall um, to a range of uh, different study sites that uh, we knew from other folks in our, our building who do studies on water movement where we might most likely find um, any kind of effluent traces going out in the environment. So some of the things um, that we found that were really interesting was, well, first of all, that we had a whole suite of compounds coming out of the wastewater treatment plant, not totally surprising. But what was surprising to us were some of the things that we were finding. Um, metformin, uh, for instance, is a type 2 diabetes medication now being prescribed for a whole host of other things. And it really hadn't been on anybody's list of things that they were finding up until this point, and uh, I actually didn't even know what the medication was until it popped up on our list. 
Um, it, ended, it started out as a um, EPA USGS um, protocol and it just happened to pop up when we were doing our study. Um, and you can see that even though we think of these things being probably pretty trace amounts, if you look at how much is really coming out of the sewage treatment plant and translate that into pounds per year, um, metformin is coming out at uh, 14,000 pounds per year going out into Lake Michigan just from one sewage treatment plant. And like I said, there are two major ones in the Milwaukee, Milwaukee metropolitan area. That's a pretty large amount. It's greater than caffeine, uh, which we think everybody is, is essentially taking caffeine uh, if you're drinking a soda or a coffee. Um, and uh, acetaminophen, also something very common that people would take. Again, metformin is at this huge quantity, so it started to pique our interest. When we looked out in the lake to see what kinds of things we would find, so we had this idea of what was going out there. You measure those same compounds going out in the lake. What we found is that several miles out into Lake Michigan, we're still detecting these compounds. And um, I realize in the graph here, you can't um, necessarily see what each one of those boxes is, but uh, I'll call your attention to the yellow. Um, each one of these boxes represents a 10, 25 nanogram per liter concentration of a chemical, and the yellow is metformin. Um, I think caffeine might be the blue boxes on that diagram. So it tells you the difference in um, presence going out into the lake. So it's fairly stable actually going out into the water. And uh, again, when we talk to our modelers, uh, that mo model particle and water movement in the lake, um, they give us an indication that there's no reason you should expect that amount out there if that compound is degrading the way that the pharmaceutical company said it was degrading. And so um, we're seeing a constant stream and it seems to have some persistence even in the water column out going out several miles into the lake. We also took a look at some of the sediments. Um, as Dana was mentioning, really important to look at things that end up accumulating down uh, in the sediment structure. And we find several of these compounds are um, have some kind of resonance in the in the uh, sediment, um, the different colors represent where we found these things. Uh, by, by and large, uh, the antibiotics um, seem, and the antiseptic compounds seem to be in the largest concentrations when you look over all the different sites. Um, but we're also finding some of the water-soluble chemicals um, either ending up in the pore water or uh, ending up in the sediment structure somehow. In these. So it's not just the uh, compounds that you would traditionally think as being not water-soluble binding to sediments and ending up down in the bottom of the lake. We, we find some of these water-soluble compounds too. So we have a water problem and we have a sediment problem. What we we're finding is not unlike what others have found um, in the near shore areas of some of the other Great Lakes. Um, we find things like pharmaceuticals, others have found those. The thing that was blowing us out of the water though is the amount that we were finding of that particular pharmaceutical metformin. Uh, but others have found personal care products, uh, pesticides, fluorinated compounds, um, phthalates, the plasticizers. Um, and there's one study, I have a nanomaterial study here. Uh, this is not from the Great Lakes, but it's what we use as an estimate for doing our, our lab work. It's actually from a stream uh, wastewater treatment plant study in, in Arizona. But it shows you the potential for nanomaterials also to end up out in the environment. So the argument before uh, has been that, and especially once, um, so there are some FDA laws about estimating the concentrations that go out in the environment and when the uh, drug company has to make some kind of ecological analysis about what kinds of environmental impacts these chemicals might have. And so the argument before is that these things are at really low concentrations, way less than one part per billion concentrations in the environment. Um, they're not at the therapeutic dose level for any of the compounds, and so you really shouldn't have to worry about them because they shouldn't trigger the same effect because we're talking nanograms, not milligrams, uh, thousands of milligrams that a person would take. Um, they shouldn't reach toxic levels, and um, they should break down readily in the environment. But the truth is, is that that's not really happening, and that's what we see in our study and others have found. Um, and we know from other studies that things like hormones, for instance, react at very tiny concentrations with organisms in the environment. Um, and some of these things are not breaking down. Uh, my grad student, Ben Blair, went through our data and looked at the concentrations we were finding. Um, the different color schemes up here are for the different areas that we did the monitoring. So the final effluent is the stuff coming out of the pipe at the end of the sewage treatment plant. Um, and at the outfall, which is this um, area in the lake, it's called the bubbler, uh, where the sewage comes out and it's exploded into the bottom part of the lake and then it's, it gets distributed. Um, also, consequentially, that's where the fishermen sit because the fish really like that area. It's nice and warm. Uh, there's lots of food uh, particles and so there's lots of organisms that are found around, around that area. Um, and then going uh, a couple miles south and a couple miles east into the lake. 
Um, and what we find is that uh, definitely at the place where the final effluent is coming out, we find concentrations that are very high. This risk quotient is a calculation done by uh, people doing environmental risk assessment where you're looking at the potential for something to cause harm to some compartment in the environment. This can be anything from bacteria to algae to invertebrates to fish. And so um, if it's above a 1, it's of a, a, a high concern. Uh, a point 0.1 is some concern. And as you get lower, there's a, a little concern. But as you can see, um, or maybe you can't, but at the, the concentrations that are especially right near the outfall and within a mile, there are several of these compounds that are triggering that over 1 uh, risk quotient, which is of concern. Um, and I'll have you note that we monitored 60 compounds, but not all of them are up here. And there's a reason for that. Sometimes uh, it is because the, we re there really is no indication that there's any kind of impact. So um, I'm not up here to say that all these compounds are bad. We actually really don't know. Um, and the reason why all 60 of them aren't up here is uh, there's a, a real lack of information what a lot of these things might do to the environment, what they might do to environmental organisms. And so they might be up there because of lack of effect, but it might also be because of lack of information. So as I was doing this study, um, the folks from the Department of Natural Resources, uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, which are in our building, um, which is great, we get to you know, have collaborations with folks that are actually doing uh, boots on the ground research about what the organisms are doing out in the lake, started coming to me and talking to me uh, about, oh, you know, you're monitoring those hormones, right? Well, we're finding these fish that look weird out in the lake and we don't know what's going on. Uh, the main one that they're really concerned about is perch. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Milwaukee, but Milwaukee has a very high Catholic population and we have, uh, we're famous for fish fries on Friday nights and perch are the main fish fry staple. Um, everybody from uh, Chinese restaurants to you know, German restaurants serve fish fry on Friday night. You have to, year round, doesn't matter if it's Lent. Um, and so the decline of these, this particular fish population is of huge concern in the Milwaukee area. Um, and so, uh, and it also around the Great Lakes, to be honest, the fisher, fishermen around the Great Lakes are interested in this perch decline. And they're finding uh, in particular when, um, it was about, I think six years ago, that the males, the gonads look weird. Um, so they said that, you know, we're catching males, but they're kind of small, and then their gonads look um, like they aren't developed fully, and we aren't really sure what's going on. Um, so sure enough, I went out the next collection event, and they weren't finding any males at all. And this has persisted over several collection events now, where they just, you're not finding males out there. And, and so uh, the first inclination is that maybe this is a hormone issue. Although I'll say that when we did our study of the stuff coming out of the sewage treatment plant, we're really finding very tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of hormones. It really doesn't, it's not a major contributor, but that metformin is huge. Um, and so we started asking the question about, could there be some other things um, in that list of chemicals that might be causing an impact? We know that from other studies uh, done by other folks, um, prominent scientists, that downstream of sewage treatment plants, we do find uh, cases of intersex fish. Um, so males that have uh, female um, characteristics, um, males that are developing eggs in their gonads. And uh, here's just an example of upstream and downstream from a sewage treatment plant. We end up finding differences in the sex ratio and the number of, of males and females, as well as differences in hormone concentrations that indicates there's some kind of feminization going on. Uh, um, there's also a, another study by uh, some of the folks at USGS that um, Dana had mentioned, Vicki Blazer and her group, talking about how they find intersex fish actually across the country. Um, here's an example of 73% of smallmouth bass caught in a lake in Minnesota had um, eggs developing in their testes. And the question is, well, what's causing these effects? And my question was, is there any of that list of things coming out of our sewage treatment plant that could potentially cause these, and how would you evaluate which ones these are? You know, if you have a whole suite of things that could potentially cause these impacts, um, then trying to ferret out which ones might be important is very difficult. And we're still struggling with this. And I, I would say I don't have the complete answer, but we started with um, the things that we found to be most common. Um, and other folks have been focusing in on the hormones. So estradiol, estrone, some of the things that act like hormones, like bisphenol A. Um, and that's really been a huge focus of the um, environmental researchers that are studying this problem up to this point. But what we know is that, um, like I said, metformin is coming out in these huge concentrations 
out in the environment. And so we were wondering, well, is there any potential impact for metformin? And we started out by doing metabolic studies. So this is a type 2 diabetes drug. Is it causing kind of metabolic impact on the fish? And um, there really isn't any information out there about metformin effects on fish other than people that have been feeding it to trout because they're trying to use it as an aquaculture species and trying to get them to eat plant material. And so they might have glucose insulin problems and, and that was really the only study out there on it. But we know that it's coming out um, at 47 micrograms per liter out into um, the water systems and, um, and other folks have found that it's coming out in high concentrations in other places like, since then, since, uh, like Canada and Germany and the Netherlands. And so we started asking the question, what about metformin? Um, it's a diabetes medication. It's the seventh most prescribed drug in the U.S. Um, there are 73 million prescriptions as of 2013, and this has grown since these last couple of years, um, and it's grown significantly um, since 2009. Um, even just in one year, uh, it rose 7%. And it, uh, according to um, some estimates, it's the drug most deposited into the environment by mass. So, and we were definitely finding that. And we started asking the question, well, could this be an endocrine disruptor? If we're really finding that to be the major effect of what's going on in fish, what about this drug? Well, the problem is, is it doesn't really resemble an endocrine disruptor that we traditionally think of as an endocrine disruptor. It doesn't look like our hormones. Um, it doesn't look like the things that are weakly estrogenic, like bisphenol A, which is a plasticizer. Um, and it's not predicted to bind to the estrogen receptor from some of the modeling programs from the um, National Institute of Health and Environmental Protection Agency where people are trying to make predictions. You know, if you have 200 chemicals, which one of these would you consider to be an estrogenic compound that you have to worry about? And they're trying to do screening before we even let these things out in the environment or make predictions of things that are already out there as to what could potentially be estrogenic. This is not one of the things that pops up. But it is being prescribed for a condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome in humans. So this is where women are having fertility problems and they develop, um, so normally during a, a reproductive cycle, a woman has one follicle that develops fully and then is the thing that ends up uh, being fertilized and, and produces a baby. Uh, in polycystic ovarian syndrome, you have multiple follicles developing all at the same time, and so not any one of them is really any good because it doesn't have the resources. And uh, doctors were finding that if they uh, prescribed this medication that it um, helps solve some fertility problems for whatever reason. Um, PCOS is uh, often associated with um, insulin resistance. So there's some indication that diabetes and some of the pre-diabetic conditions might be affecting fertility and, and so this drug may have some kind of impact on that. And that triggered me to start thinking, well, then it might have some kind of endocrine impact, um, even though it's not traditionally looking like an endocrine disruptor. And so we did some studies just to figure this out. Our chosen organism uh, is the fathead minnow. It's an EPA toxicology model. And the nice thing about the fathead minnow, first of all, it's a native to the Midwest. Um, so we do some studies where we put them out in streams and, and uh, right at the source of effluents or other contaminants and look to see what kind of um, impacts they might have on the fatheads. But what's nice also is they have uh, this distinctive look if they're male or female. Uh, male is the top picture there. He's got this big, huge fat pad on top of his head. And the females are kind of longer and skinnier. Um, if they're pregnant, they're, they've got a round bottom. Uh, the males use that fat pad to, um, they're the ones that make the nest. And so you can see in the bottom picture these little half circle um, uh, PVC pipes that we give them to make nests. And they go under a a log or a rock and they'll use their fat pad and clean it off and then attract a female under there and they uh, flip her up on her side to lay eggs and they fertilize the eggs and then they take care of the eggs. And so we can use these guys for not just um, looking at physiology but also looking at behavior and how their reproductive behavior might change. So we started looking at um, a chronic exposure. So this is a traditional thing you would do for looking at um, the impact of a chemical. Um, and we took adult fish, an adult male and adult females, and paired them up and put them in exposure tanks and had controls, and we exposed them at the concentration we were seeing coming out of the sewage treatment plant, actually just a little bit lower, and uh, looked to see if we saw any impact. And what we found is that there was no really significant difference in the number of eggs they were producing and the behaviors we were seeing or in the histology. So we weren't seeing intersex condition in the fish. 
And we really didn't see any differences in the hormones of the fish, um, either in the males or the females. So looking at testosterone or um, vitelligenin is an egg yolk protein that's an indicator of endocrine disruption in males. So it's normally not produced in males, but if they're exposed to a hormone, uh, estrogen, then they start producing this egg yolk protein when they really shouldn't. And, and so it's an, people are using it as an indicator of vitelligenin production. When we looked at the gene expression for vitelligen, what we did find is that there was an increase uh, from the controls of the um, uh, vitelligen and gene expression in metformin-treated males. Uh, again, this is also an indicator of some kind of endocrine disruption. So it gave us our first indication that maybe something was going on, but it really wasn't having any kind of significant effect on the fish that we could see. Um, and so, and it had no effect on the females that we could see. So we started asking the question, you know, if the DNR is starting to see these fish that have these weird gonads, maybe there's something happening way before adult that's really impacting the development of these fish. So what happens if you expose uh, larvae um, all the way up through adult, um, do you end up seeing some different kind of effect? Um, and so we didn't uh, expose at this early egg stage. We exposed at about uh, 90 days, 60 to 90 day old uh, larvae uh, all the way up through reproductive adults. So it was about a year long exposure to these things. And it was kind of just a, you know, we didn't really see a tremendous effect to begin with. Let's just see. And it was a, some tanks over on the side of the lab. We didn't really expect to see much. And, uh, but what we did find was that um, there were significant impacts when you did that very long uh, exposure from early on. We saw differences in the weight of both males and females. So the exposed fish were smaller, uh, both in um, uh, uh, weight and, and size. And so there probably is some kind of metabolic thing going on. And most importantly, uh, what we started seeing was intersex fish. So the male fish were producing eggs in the testes, indicating that there is some kind of impact of that gene expression that's, that has some kind of thing going on further down the line. So maybe that was our early indicator that it does some, have some kind of metabolic impact. Um, we find, um, I don't think I have a graph here, but we find the um, intersex fish in uh, about 85 to 90% of the exposed males and in only a couple percent of the unexposed males. So it does happen sometimes naturally, but really it's a huge skew with the exposure to this metformin. We also find a reprodu re uh, reproductive output is decreased. So the number of um, uh, eggs per uh, clutch and the clutches per pair end up decreasing when you're exposed to this uh, metformin. So the question is, uh, is uh, metformin in particular, uh, is, an, is it a potential endocrine disruptor? And the answer is, yeah, we think that it probably is. And it's not one that we traditionally thought of as being an endocrine disruptor. This is kind of a fluke. Uh, like I said, it was kind of a side project in the lab. It was over, uh, we're just like, ah, we'll see if we see any effect. This drug is coming out at a huge concentration. And we don't really know what exactly is going on. So uh, we know it doesn't really bind to the estrogen receptor, so that's not the way it's acting. Um, in the literature, for humans, the way they think this acts is through the AMP kinase uh, pathway where it's affecting fatty acid oxidation and gluco glucose uptake and insulin sensitivity. Like I said, that ends up influencing that PCOS condition, and that's why it's being prescribed. But they don't really understand how. Um, and steroidogenesis, the, um, what we're being uh, prescribed, the medication for the PCOS syndrome, also is related to vitelogenesis in, in fish. And so that might be why we're um, seeing some kind of impact on, on male production of eggs. But we really don't understand the mechanism about why this is happening and why would you all of a sudden see vitelligenin production when there shouldn't be any. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out right now. And where along the developmental pathway does the medication have to be introduced in order for there to be an impact? So here we probably have an even more complicated story where it's not just is the drug really having an impact, but when? Um, and as I said, the perch sit at the outfall of the sewage effluent and sometimes during their reproductive season. And, um, and that's why the fishermen are there fishing them. And so it's possible that it's during this critical stage that this is happening. Um, and so maybe there's some way of dealing with this where um, I, I, you physically have um, no exposure during a certain period of time. The other thing we have to worry about with this particular medication, as well as uh, many of the other chemicals that we're talking about, are the transformation products and the breakdown products of these compounds. Metformin does not break down, uh, but it does get transformed in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, it's not completely transformed. We end up finding both the, break, uh, the transformation product, guanylurea, and metformin coming out of wastewater treatment plants. Um, and uh, we're doing studies in the lab right now looking to see if guanylurea has the same kind of impact as metformin does on these fish.
Now, of course, there are all sorts of other chemicals that are coming out of our wastewater treatment plant as well, so maybe metformin isn't the whole story. Um, maybe it has some kind of impact, but there are some other things that have equal uh, numbers of impact. And so uh, my uh, postdoc, Jordan Crago, went through and looked at all the things that we were finding coming out, and in the stream studies that have been done by the U.S. Geological Survey around the Milwaukee area, um, to see what are the uh, most common things found. Uh, so they're found most often and at um, significant concentrations over the period of a season. Um, and we narrowed it down to about 10 compounds that we studied in the lab. So we looked at uh, things like bifenthrin, carbamazepine, uh, DEHP, which is a plasticizer, um, diltiazem, which is um, an antidepressant, but also prescribed for other things. Um, or I'm sorry, uh, it's prescribed for high blood pressure. Fluoxetine, which is an antidepressant, uh, prescribed for other things as well. Um, Jumfibrazil, which is a cholesterol, uh, um, production inhibitor, um, and metformin, as well as uh, a couple other things. And we looked to see, um, of those compounds, uh, if you looked at their effects at the concentrations that they're found in the environment, do you end up seeing any kind of impact on, on organisms? Uh, and particularly in this case, we were looking at zebrafish, um, looking to see if it had an impact on um, reproduction, but then also at earlier time points, if it had any impact on some of the genes that are related to the production of endocrine hormones and the development sexually of these fish. And these are our first studies. This is a, um, a study that's in prep. Um, and this is just the gene expression studies. One of the genes we looked at was GNRH, which is known to be a gene that's related to um, the neuroendocrine system and particularly related to the development of a uh, fish being male or female. Um, and so uh, in several different species um, and also in, in humans as well. And so um, the numbers that you see here, the ones that are in red are the ones that were significant at the concentrations that are found out in the environment. Um, or I'm sorry, yellow represents the concentrations measured in the environment. Red is the ones that are actually significant. And so if you look, there are two compounds, DEHP, which is that plasticizer, and um, guanylurea and metformin also um, at the concentrations that are found in the environment appear to be um, related to the expression of this gene as well as some of the other genes along the endocrine pathway. And I've just represented this one right here um, as I, it, I find it very interesting. But um, uh, you can see that many of the other compounds really don't have any kind of impact. So there's good news and a bad news story. There are a few compounds that even at environmental low, low, low environmental concentrations have an endocrine impact. And it's not just metformin, it's also its transformation product and, and another compound. But there are also a whole suite of compounds that alone don't seem to have an impact. So it might be possible that we need to narrow down to you know, there's a, a select few that we really need to concentrate on. By getting rid of those, we might also um, just positively get rid of some of the other things as well. I'll say that some of the other compounds that we've measured, um, uh, like fluoxetine, this is actually where I started, was on the neuroendocrine compounds because um, they, again, they act at a very low concentration. Um, also can have some kind of impact on reproduction, even if they're not particularly affecting hormones. Um, this is just an, uh, an indication of uh, Prozac having an impact on mating performance and fathead minnows. I, I remember I told you that the male ends up attracting the female into the nest and um, uh, does all these behaviors, and what we find at, at the concentrations that are relative to what is in the treatment plant, so not out in the environment, um, that it ends up causing a change in the amount of time the male spends under the mating tile and at very high concentrations to the point where he's not interested in the female and ends up um, uh, in the early stages of exposure killing the female, bad for reproduction. Uh, so not a hormone effect, but a behavior effect that can have an, a negative impact. Also an increase in time to capture prey items, which could end up affecting the biology of the organism. So it goes beyond just hormone effects. Um, there are also uh, issues with synergistic effects of chemicals, and these are really hard studies to do. Um, there are a few people trying to tackle what do you do with the whole suite of chemicals and narrow down which chemicals might be causing an impact. Uh, this is, a, again, another study from Jordan Crago uh, in my lab looking at the interaction between DEHP and linuron, which is a pesticide. Um, when it, there's some indication that each one of these is an endocrine disruptor, but when you look at the concentrations that are found in the environment and look at the potential for it being an endocrine disruptor at those concentrations, for each one of those chemicals, he found that it doesn't cause an impact. It's only at the really high concentrations that other people had done their studies that you find that they're an endocrine disruptor. But when you add the two of them together um, at concentrations that are environmentally relevant, they do decrease uh, testosterone levels in, in the males. And so um, we have this issue where most of our studies are with these single compounds, but mixtures are, might actually be where the story is. And we don't really have great ways of doing screening. These are really involved experiments.
And if you think about uh, hundreds of chemicals, it makes it even harder. So the overall take home message is that we don't know what these compounds are doing. And um, really, we need to know what kind of impacts they might have in order to have any kind of control measures. Uh, but the other questions we also ask in our lab are, you know, is there a possibility that we could remove most of them from the wastewater treatment system? Or can we develop some kind of other alternatives that these things don't have some kind of environmental impact? And there have been several different calls uh, for more studies, for policies related to um, these compounds and how they might impact the environment, um, and that we really need more information in order to make better choices. And so if you look at what do we currently do to protect um, the environment in relationship to uh, these chemicals and what might be put in place, um, uh, it's troubling, but people are starting to work on those issues. So it's not just the scientists doing the work on you know, the potential impacts, but, but what can we do about our policies? Um, the FDA, for instance, the Food and Drug Administration, which is in charge of all those pharmaceuticals, has this one part per billion limit for, uh, of environmental levels, estimated environmental levels, before it triggers um, an assessment of the potential environmental impacts. And they just released uh, a, a document for comment, and which hopefully will go into regulation, where if you have any indication that something is estrogen acting or an endocrine uh, function acting, that you have to do different studies, uh, which is our first step towards uh, having some kind of improvement in the way that we're looking at these chemicals. Um, the Safe Drinking Water Act, we have this contaminants of concern list where various chemicals are put on this list for monitoring. Um, and I just learned from Dana that they're going to be doing a drinking water study, which is really exciting. Um, but we have uh, this contaminants of concern list where a couple of these emerging contaminants have been put on for monitoring. And the problem is that we have is that um, the we don't have the information about what effects these things cause. So we might end up monitoring a chemical. It's all over the United States, but we don't have any biological information about what impact they cause at that concentration. And so the chemical doesn't get regulated. In fact, from the CCL list, only one chemical has been regulated so far um, out of the, I think, three or four lists that they've had so far. Um, there is permitting issues through the uh, Clean Water Act and uh, pesticide issues through FIFRA, where there are some testing and monitoring required. But really, it's not enough, uh, and it hasn't been enough to catch these chemicals. Compounds. Um, the main focus has been on treatment technologies and how to improve our wastewater treatment plants, which is a multi-billion dollar um, investment, trillion dollar investment, if you go across the country in trying to refit all of our wastewater treatment plants to solve this problem. And what we find is that um, here's the, the first part of our experiment where we're looking at what passes through the wastewater treatment plant. Some things are removed uh, to a great extent and other things are not. Um, and even the things that are removed to a great extent, if they're coming in at a huge quantity, not all of it gets removed. And there's some kind of plateau that's reached. Um, the EPA did a, a review several years ago looking at all the treatment technologies and a whole host of things that have been measured going through the treatment plan. And what they find is that there's no one technology that removes everything. Um, ozone does a great job of supposedly removing things. But um, we know now that there are all these transformation products that can happen from ozonation. And we have no idea what they, really even what those chemicals are. Um, there's a focus right now on this non-target analysis, looking for compounds that we didn't know existed um, in our, our treatment processes and in our, our water systems to try to figure out what are those compounds that are produced after you do these treatment technologies. There are also new technologies being developed, like um, nanoparticle removal treatments, where um, they're hoping to bind these chemicals to nanoparticles within the wastewater treatment plant and look at, uh, and then take the nanoparticles out and, and use them as waste. Um, here's an example of Actiflow Carb, which was something we worked on with uh, Veolia International, uh, which runs our wastewater treatment plant. We find that um, this activated carbon nanoparticle ends up removing a good number of the compounds that we're talking about. It's kind of an enhanced form of activated charcoal, basically. Um, that ends up removing about um, 85 to 90 percent of, of most of the compounds that we tested. Um, but the question is, you know, what about that last little bit that goes through? We have drug collection programs that uh, started um, back in 2007 across the United States. Um, uh, you know, and, and people focus on these. It's something that I think the general public can grasp onto. Um, I think we have a poster or presentation on one of these things. And the question is, how much? Uh, of a solution is this. Um, a really, uh, there's probably much more contamination by people actually taking their medication and it going out in the environment than from 
people dumping things down the, the toilet, um, but, uh, but it's still obviously a potential source um, and something that needs to be addressed. We did a, a count at one of these collections, one of the first collection events in Milwaukee, and we find that people keep things in their cabinet for a very long time. Uh, the oldest uh, medicine that we found was from 1963. Um, that was in 2007. So um, there's some pretty wacky things that people brought back to that collection event. So um, maybe dumping down the toilet in, a, in the house might not be as big a deal as maybe even hospitals or other things. The other thing we're doing, we got a small grant from the Argosy Foundation, is to look at the whole process from drug development to the um, uh, evaluation in the pharmaceutical company to approval and testing um, in human populations to prescriptions to people actually using it in the home to the disposal process, whether that's dumping it down the toilet or people using it and going into the waste stream. And look and see, not just focus on the end of the pipe, um, and the treatment plant, which is super expensive uh, to retrofit all these things, but look at all these other steps before that and what kind of impact could we make um, on any one of those steps? Where are the easy places where we could make some kind of change that would end up impacting what we're doing? Um, we've taken the top 20 medications that are being prescribed right now as, as uh, some of the um, ones that we're evaluating, and for instance, metformin, the number of times that thing is prescribed for um, different uses has grown in the last decade. So it started out in about the early 90s. Um, if you talk to doctors and nurses, it's not an effective medication. Why are we using it? Um, and yet it has been um, prescribed for uh, about 10 other different conditions now. Um, and so the prescription rate has gone through the roof, and it's probably why we're seeing it in the environment. And the question is, there's some place along there um, even just within that approval process or prescribing process where we could make an impact. So that's what we're working on now. So overall, we need to know what these things can do, uh, evaluate different treatment technologies, but really consider some other types of behavioral changes that could be put in place and not just always focus on the treatment technology as our, our endpoint. That's almost the easy solution is trying to figure out what to do at the end of the pipe rather than trying to improve the process going all the way uh, from the beginning to the end. Um, so considering those behavioral changes might really make the biggest amount of difference. And lastly, I just wanted to acknowledge the research I'm presenting is not just mine, but it's a huge host of students and postdocs um, and technicians that are in my lab that are fantastic. And here are some of the main ones that I, I cited today. Jordan Crago, um, who was a grad student and a postdoc in my lab, and Nicholas Nemeth are the ones that have been responsible for that Metformin work so far. Uh, but also uh, Ben Blair and some other folks in the lab as well. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Measuring the chemical itself or measuring impacts from the chemical? So I would say the chemical itself because once, once in my opinion, so they do atrazine testing and things like that already, once, once the awareness is there, then it becomes more of a situation if these kids can measure this pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. then really it's a bigger impact to not only people who are in the community, uh, but people who are yeah, there have been a couple citizen science is what we call it, and as scientists, I don't know what you guys call it, but uh, uh, efforts. Okay, <laughs> this efforts. Um, there's notably been one up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, overall, these uh, compounds are fairly hard to detect, and actually, Dana would be a better person to talk to about any 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 one of the compounds that might be easier to assay. Yeah, if you're into like a metformin or carbamazepine, Braxis sells these Eliza kits. Yeah, we've talked to Braxis a couple of times, and, and uh, I think the thing that that hits us is, is uh, we have to find somebody who we can use their equipment to do that with, mm -hmm. right? So um, we've talked to a practice, uh, uh, Carl Caulfield, uh, uh, or Curtis Caulfield over there, and I think they do, and we get most of our stuff from a practice as it is. I think that it'd be good, it would be cool to see who else is doing that to where we can maybe mimic some of that same testing. 
It might be a good thing. You might make a connection here at this conference, especially with people. Or you're in the Illinois area here, I assume. Yeah. So I, I imagine because uh, what you essentially need is a plate reader, um, a good plate reader, right, for those ELISA assays. So talking to maybe um, the extension service or some of the scientists here at the university, someone here has to have one of those plate readers that they might be interested in helping with a citizen very science cool. project. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions? Yes. Please. Yeah. For your explosion experiment, you using like a four-day micro Mm -hmm. It's kind of high concentration, but I just wondering, you know, uh, did you using some low concentration, like demand level concentration, to long term? Because you use only eight to eight days, maybe a couple months. This may be, you know, like a chronic infection, not a, like a acute infection. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So we've done, um, so the reason we chose that 40 was because that's what we were finding coming out of our wastewater treatment plant. So for Milwaukee, that was environmentally relevant from right near where the fish are, the perch are anyway. Um, but the zebrafish experiments, we've dropped the levels down much lower um, to a thousand fold lower. And what we're finding is we're still finding that increase in the production of the mRNA transcripts. And um, we're just finishing actually the reproductive experiments right now. What we see is when you start from an egg, going all the way to the end, you don't see that um, histology result. So we think that there's one spot, one time point probably, a range of time point in that zebrafish development where you see the change in the histology. But we do see the gene expression change and we see hormone changes and we see gene expression changes in um, many, many, many points along that um, endocrine pathway. Um, so not just the initial ones we measured, but a whole suite of genes that ends up being responsive to that exposure, even at really low concentrations. And uh, again, the mechanism, we don't really know yet. We're trying to figure that out. Is there another question? Okay, well, we'll yes, Lance. Could you comment on the, uh, the look at the non end of pipe, uh, I guess, amendments? Which ones of those look most promising for having a big impact at a low cost? I think, um, like I said, some of the behavioral changes. I think um, from what we've seen right now, part of it is the post-development of the drug, um, the marketing of the drug for the 20 different other diseases where, you know, it might not have been designed for that to begin with. Um, it, there are a couple of things that are a problem. So the FDA regulation on looking at the environmental impacts is based on the first initial um, drug introduction. And what we see is that any subsequent um, use of that medication in the other new use categories, just refer back to that initial thing. And so it's the original estimate of what might be going out. And so if you look at, first of all, when you look at metformin, the estimate that they made was wrong based on what we now know as what was going out in the environment and the persistence of it in the wastewater treatment plant. So their initial estimate of how much would be out there is wrong. But then you add on the 20 new uses where they've combined it with maybe one other little drug. It goes back to their initial calculation of what would go out in the environment. It's not an addition of the populations that might be included. And so it seems like that's one easy target where you do a different calculation um, and base it on real true information about intended populations use where you could end up, um, you know, you might end up with the company or with a better testing method maybe initially for environmental impact. But really it's that environmental testing needs to be improved based on and the modeling of what might go out in the environment. Um, and so if we do that more at the beginning, then you don't have it going on at the end. Also then the prescription rates. Seems like there needs to be a health community conversation that isn't, uh, it's starting to happen, but it's not completely happening right now about um, prescription um, behavior um, and why you might prescribe something over another. There might be some education about the intended uh, consequences versus unintended consequences that might happen. That would be much cheaper than <laughs> trying to put trillions of dollars of equipment on the end of a sewage treatment plant pipe. Great. Well, thanks so much for your talk. Yeah, thank you.